Welcome, welcome, welcome to Children of Single Parents, our overlooked stakeholders. I love when we can have a conversation of a, about practical, real life education. I am all about this topic. So I am Dr. Desiree Alexander. I am your host for this EA webinar. Welcome. If you're watching us on the YouTube channel, no, you don't get the certificate, but you do get the knowledge. And right underneath the video in the description, you will see the link to the resource for today. And it's a wonderful article that you do not want to miss. These are all of the different ways you can contact me. Hello. And what do we have coming up? Well, TCCA in Houston, Texas. This is a wonderful, wonderful conference. It's the largest one-day conference in the state of Texas. Um, and it's the largest conference besides the actual big state conference, which is CCEA. So if you're interested, this is completely free. I'm going to be there. You can get all kinds of EA goodies. And these are all of my sessions for that day. Then we have Organizing Your Professional Products with yeah, I'm going to be presenting on November 5th. This was requested. People are like, okay, you do all these different projects, but oh my goodness, I tried to do one and I just, you know, everything was everywhere. I was so stressed out. I'm like, no, take all these organizing tips from me to you. So can't wait to do that one. Then we have Rochelle rounding out our year with the final two episodes for this year, I think think. You just, you just never know what can pop up. And then we have three, we have three tools with endless possibilities in November. So she's going to talk about three tech tools. And then we have AI in education. What do we need to know? So you want to take your educational game a little bit further, your tech game a little bit further and really look at augmented reality and all, all these things. Um, you can come and learn about AI in, um, in technology, in education. So, and I said augmented reality, and that's AR, but you know, but we're going we're to keep rolling. All right. So then we have TCEA, which is um, this the Texas State Conference um, in January and February. So this is, a, we feel like it's a long way away, but you know that's going to be here. You're going to blink your eyes and it's going to be January. We know that. So there you go. And then, of course, we always have our self-paced online courses that you can always jump into. And tell me what you want to learn in 2023. We have about eight webinars right now being planned. I cannot wait until I can send out that email saying, hey, these are all of the webinars that are coming up next semester. But if you want to be on that email, if you want to present, or if you just want to say, hey, I want to see this topic. I don't want to do it, but I want to see it. Let me know at that link. Ooh. So, it is about that time to get the information that you came here for, which is talking about our children in single parent homes. So I'm going to be quiet and we are going to get started. Excellent. Well, thank you all for coming. There are so many places you could have been on a Saturday morning. If you're like my wife and myself, we often catch up on our sleep on Saturday morning because we work such long hours. Uh, I know there's football all over the place, but you chose to be here, and I really appreciate you being here, and I promise you it's going to fly by. Uh, we have a lot of interesting information. This is something I've researched, uh, but that I've lived as well, and it has become a passion of mine over the years, and I really appreciate Dr. Alexander bringing me on to share with it. I got to know Dr. Alexander a little bit back in the summer. I presented at a online conference uh, headquartered in Memphis by a group called Lausanne Learning. And she often presents for them as well. And so we connected and she was interested in this topic and I can't thank her enough for bringing me on. So we'll get started with it. So a little bit about me. This is my wife and myself to the left. We went to Boston this summer. First time I have ever been to Boston. Uh, Dr. Desiree and I were talking about that just before we went live. Got to see a lot of neat history. Uh, my wife, Michelle, runs the optical department uh, at Southern College of Optometry in Memphis, Tennessee, where they train eye doctors. And we live just over the river, the Mississippi River in Marion, Arkansas. Up at the top, you see my school. I am a seventh grade ELA teacher at East Junior High in West Memphis, Arkansas. This is our last year to exist as a school. They are combining our school with a school called Wonder Junior High, about three miles down the road. They're building a big brand new school. They're combining the two, but we're going under that school's name. 
And so uh, I wore my shirt in honor of it. Remember the Red Imps is our slogan this year. That's our, our motto, our mascot. This is me down at the bottom in my classroom. So that's a little bit about me. Um, like I said, Michelle and I live here in Marion, Arkansas. We're newlyweds. We have only been married just over a year. We met online uh, through Zeusk.com and uh, just the best wife I could ever ask for. Can't brag enough on my wonderful wife. We, um, Michelle does not have any children. I have two grown children now. They're 18 and 20. And so um, we just spoil nieces and nephews and our two cats. So uh, that's our life outside of, of working. We, uh, we also teach Sunday school here locally at our local church. Uh, we enjoy hiking uh, and camping a time or two. We um, like to go to concerts, uh, read, just uh, enjoying life together. So that's me uh, at school and at home and at work. The uh, topic I'm going to talk about is very personal. So before we go into it, I'll share with you how this became such a passion of mine. Uh, and I take you back to the year 2009. I was married, uh, obviously, to a different woman at the time. We were raising our two sons. That's the one. This is Daniel um, to the left in the top picture and Grayson to the right. That's on a canoe trip. Uh, in the middle picture, this is Daniel's high school graduation. And that's Grayson to the left and myself to the right. And the bottom picture is me on that same canoe trip you see at the top. Going back to 2009, I was married. Uh, from the outside looking in, you would think we were uh, the model family and the model couple. We were living in a small town uh, just east of Memphis, Tennessee. We were very active in the First Baptist Church in our local town. I was the Sunday school director. My uh, wife at that time was a school teacher in the local school district. I had not gone into teaching. This is actually on my fifth year as a teacher. I was uh, in medical office management at the time. We were involved in the community. Our children played sports in the local leagues. Uh, so we just looked like the model of uh, small town USA couple from the outside looking in. What you would not see from the outside looking in was a house of cards that was truly what our family was. We um, had a pretty good five years of marriage. And then year five, uh, Daniel was born. And as you often see with young couples, um, when children begin to come on the scene, it becomes much more difficult to balance everything. And so our marriage began to struggle at that point. Um, by the time it came to a head, uh, our children were five and seven. So we're roughly 10 years into our marriage at this point, and things are, are not going well at all. We had been through various stints, several different stints of marriage counseling, uh, we had seen some help, uh, but overall things were not really improving. So it came to a head one particular night when we got into a pretty heated verbal argument. My wife at the time called our pastor's wife. We had been in some counseling with our pastor as well, and she was so concerned. She called the local police who came out. They came in, they talked to us, um, they made the decision that one of us needed to leave for the night. And so I said that I would, that was a Tuesday night. Uh, I went to church from work on Wednesday night to notice that my family wasn't there. Came home afterward uh, to see that they weren't there. Was able to learn from various friends that they were okay, but the, they did not, my wife of the time did not want me to know where they were. That was Wednesday night. Thursday night, no one was at my house um, until a sheriff's deputy knocked on the door and served me with a temporary order of protection with a court date in two weeks. Uh, that was Thursday night. Friday night went by. Saturday, our pastor called and asked if there was another place I could stay temporarily while we worked things out. And I got permission to stay with my grandparents uh, who lived a couple of miles away with whom I was very close thinking I would only be there a week or two um, to eventually learn I would be there a year and would uh, endure separation and divorce papers during that time. So what I thought was a brief separation, what our pastor thought was a brief separation, turned into uh, a very bitter divorce and custody agreement. I 
went two weeks later to the protection order hearing, um, having never had any interaction within the court system, uh, didn't hire a lawyer. I thought I could just show up, uh, tell the truth and everything would be fine, uh, which I learned was a, was a major mistake. Uh, the decision of the judge was that I was not to see my wife of the time or children for a year. Um, and I, I can tell you with, with all honesty, I was very loving, not an abusive father. So these were you know, political, not political, these were legal tactics that were being used. So uh, was ordered that day not to see my children for a year. Ended up having to hire an attorney, of course, at that point. Uh, over the next year, my attorney, my soon-to-be ex-wife's attorney would make various handshake agreements uh, saying I could see the kids only to have them uh, those agreements broken. So for the next year, I probably saw my children roughly maybe a month's worth of days. So very difficult next week, very hard on me emotionally. Uh, the divorce finally finalized about a year and a half later. I was able to get 39% of the parenting time and um, joint decision-making. So, you know, obviously we were able to show there was, there was not abuse. I was a very loving father, but um, it took, you know, a year and a half of constant legal work and about $25,000 of legal expenses that I really didn't have. I couldn't have done it without the help of um, my parents, friends and family, and uh, the house selling after the divorce is actually what paid off most of my legal expenses. And I suspect my ex-wife's legal expenses too. So uh, began to study the topic of parental alienation, which is where one parent turns the child or children against the other. And there's a lot of information about their own parental alienation. A lot of psychologists have studied it. And I began to feel like that was what I was enduring. So I got my children back 39, 40% of the time. Uh, one of my, my youngest child was very close to me. Things were going great. I never did totally recover the relationship with my oldest child. Uh, to this day, it's still very estranged. So um, went through the next several years getting involved in their lives, poured myself into their lives. Every school function I was there, uh, every PTO meeting, uh, a real godsend was that uh, they were interested in Cub Scouts. And they are, at this point, six and eight years old. Cub Scouts opened so many extra doors. It just so happened that almost every time there was a camp out or a weekend event, it was during her parenting time. And uh, she was not the outdoorsy type, so she was very happy to let me handle that. So I picked up a lot of extra parenting time uh, through Cub Scouts, taking them to the scout events. That was awesome. They uh, were also involved in church league basketball and uh, YMCA soccer. And that opened up a lot of extra opportunities for me to see them. So I just totally made a basically a second unpaid career of pouring my life into uh, anything my children were involved in. Uh, something else I did was I really promoted myself on social media. Looking back, I, I think I took it too far. Uh, my degree, my first degree is in marketing from the University of Memphis. And at the time, I was the marketing director for the largest women's health practice in Memphis. It wasn't until five years ago I became a teacher, made a total career change. So I realized that my strength uh, was PR. And uh, I used that to get myself back out there in the community, uh, prove to the community that I was a good dad. I really took it too far looking back. But at the time, that was my mindset. And I felt like, um, that I had to prove myself. So I really got on social media, really constantly put up pictures of myself with my children and did that sort of thing. And really just rebuilt myself as dad again. We went on for several years and things went okay. Very strong relationship with my youngest son. Uh, had my oldest son just as much, but very tense relationship. Uh, when they got to the age of I believe it was 15 and 16, another incident occurred. We went to McDonald's one night in our local town. Uh, my youngest son was, was sort of acting out, just 
being a typical teenager, shouting across the restaurant, just being silly, but embarrassing me because he wasn't really acting appropriately. And so as we're driving home, I'm reprimanding him. You can't act like that. You know, you're embarrassing us. You, you don't act like that in public. Don't shout across the restaurant at people. And um, got a sarcastic response. And so in return, I said, well, you have to give me your phone for the night. Uh, unknown to me, well, I did suspect it. Mom paid for the two phones. Um, and mom had coached them very sternly. Never turn over your phone to dad. I'm paying the bill. He's not. There was never any teamwork between us. I was never able to build that sense of teamwork, uh, even in co-parenting uh, with her. And so as we pull in the driveway, my youngest son begins to walk down the major highway we lived on, uh, the three miles back on the highway to his mother's house, uh, calls his mother, says to come get him. And um, that was a Saturday night. On the following Monday, I go to pick up my children for the next parenting time, only to be met by a local police officer who tells me there have been allegations of abuse and that I am not to pick them up. Uh, the next day, I receive a call from the Department of Human Services in Tennessee to tell me that there have been allegations of abuse and that um, she has interviewed them and she currently sees no evidence of that. Go ahead and pick up your children Thursday for your next scheduled parenting time. Uh, that she would be interviewing me personally. Um, she needed to do a home visit, but that overall she didn't suspect anything. Uh, so I go Thursday night on her advice, uh, only to be met again by the Sheriff's Department this time, who was serving me with yet another order of protection. Uh, things didn't go well with, with that incident either. It turned into yet another um, which is now three years of, of alienation. Uh, my, that was about three years ago. Uh, incidentally, the Department of Human Services totally cleared me. They said, you're a wonderful father. I want you involved in their lives. And it had absolutely no bearing on any court decisions. So um, uh, the court never said this time, don't see your children. It, it kind of got into lawyer negotiations and uh, in the meantime, they were pretty much alienated once again. So three years later, we're at the present now. Uh, my children are 18 and 20. My youngest son, and this is such a praise, my wife and I have been praying for this, uh, last Sunday night came to visit us and spent five hours here. First time he'd ever been to our house. Uh, my oldest son, I have not spoken with at all in two and a half years. I call and or text him every week or two, and it's, uh, total estrangement right now, but we are seeing a lot of progress with my youngest son. We've been praying a lot. And God is just really answering that prayer. So that's my personal story. That's what brings us to this. Because of all these experiences, it when it came time to do my master's capstone um, in 2020, I had changed careers. I was in school at Union University to uh, become a teacher. And it came time to do my master's capstone, and I knew exactly what I wanted to write about, and that was children of single parents, because that was my passion and that was my life. So that's how we get to this point. The good news from all this, let me minimize the chat box here so I can see. There. The good news is I survived. I'm happily remarried. Uh, I have the true love of my life, and I can't brag on her enough. And yes, she is listening from the other room. <laughs> um, and now I'm attempting to encourage others in similar situations. So I, I think God puts us through situations to allow us to encourage others who will go through those situations. The bad news is that although I would like to think I'm in a very unique situation, I have learned that I'm not. Every day, loving parents lose contact with their children at the hands of the legal system. In fact, I promoted this webinar um, to my coworkers. And on Monday, one of my coworkers came up to me during uh, dismissal duty and uh, was asking me why I'd chosen this topic and described a very similar situation that he had gone through in his own life. So it's not as unique as I want to think it is. And that's, that's the bad news. It should not be that way. So here's our agenda. We have five subtopics that we will cover and then we'll wrap it up. And after each subtopic, I'm going to stop uh, for a Q&A period. 
this is really too much information to ask you to save your questions to the end. So we will have five different Q&A sessions. And I promise you, this is such an interesting topic. This is going to fly by. So um, first, we'll talk about the question of what is the issue? Next, how does it impact education? How do demographics factor into the situation? What are the long-term effects? And what can we do as educators? And then we'll wrap it all up. So what is the issue? According to the 2015 census data, uh, approximately 22.4 million American children are being raised by single parents. That's a lot of children. And these children make up about 27% of the overall number of Americans under 21. That means one fourth of the people in this nation under 21 are being raised by single parents. That's a lot of children. Single parent homes are now the second most common family arrangement in America. If you're like me, I grew up in the eighties and it was kind of taboo at that time. You were embarrassed uh, when you got a divorce or you were embarrassed when your parents got a divorce. That's rare now. It's just so common. People don't even think anything about it. Single parent homes comprise 23% of, of overall recorded homes. In other words, you drive down a cove, pick out four houses, one of those four houses uh, contains a single parent, statistically speaking. The United States leads the world in this statistic. Probably one thing to do with that is the uh, advent of the no-fault divorce law is so much easier to get a divorce now. Uh, we're in a culture which doesn't really value marriage anymore. And many of the other cultures around still place a heavy value on marriage. And so I think that probably has a lot to do with it. According to a 2019 study by the Pew Research Center, the U.S. has the world's highest rate of children living in single parent households. And we have been seeing an upward trend over the years in that. So between 1960 and 2016, the percentage of children living with only their mother tripled from 8% to 23%. The percentage of children living with only dad went from 1% to 4%. So what does this look like to you as a teacher? If your classroom matches the national figures and you've got 25 desks in your classroom, these are the desks, the red desks are the ones with children of single parents. So just on the national average, this is what your classroom looks like. Um, the red desks are single parent children, the blue desks are traditional parent families. But if you teach in a public school, it probably doesn't match that at all. So according to these, accompanying these figures, we have some very disturbing trends academically. Research from a variety of sources, according to Ohio State, uh, corroborates the claim that children from single parent families are outperformed in the classroom by their counterparts from two parent families. You put the single parent children beside the two parent traditional children and the single parent children are not performing as well statistically on average. According to a research study from Penn State, cumulative evidence suggests that children who live in single parent families tend to perform more poorly on standardized tests as well. We all have our opinions about standardized tests, but we are stuck with them. And so um, your district, if it has a lot of children from single parent homes, is statistically speaking, probably going to score lower than a district with fewer single parent homes. Achievement gaps, according to St. John's University, a study they did on international tests in math science between American students and their industrialized counterparts have worsened over the past 40 years. So as Americans, we're not stacking up as well against our international competitors. So the trend of single parenting growth matches the trend of academic decline. <clears throat> Also a study from St. John's University in New York, what seems to count is that a large fraction of the variation in student achievement is accounted for in out of school variables, such as the student's community, home, or peer group characteristics. Uh, your home is an out of school variable. What we're saying in plain English is the home performance and atmosphere is affecting the school performance. 
And so to put all of that in layman's terms, there appears to be an obvious correlation between the increase in the number of single parent homes and the decrease or decline in academic performance. So let's explore the specific impact on education. Before we do, let's discuss, does anybody have any questions thus far just about the issue itself? None so far. All right, I'll give it about 10 seconds and then we'll move on. Let's move on then to the impact on education. That was just a quick overview of the issue itself. Well, how does it impact education more specifically? There are five specific ways that I have identified. Financial pressures, educational opportunities outside of school, time constraints, lowered expectations, and biological effects. Let's look at financial pressures first. According to Maureen Boyle, who is an economist with the United States government, single parent households headed by women are of special interest because they are more likely to be poor than are other households with children. Nearly half of all households in poverty are headed by women. Uh, and we all know, we've heard the statistics, it should not be this way, but in the current world in which we live, women do not tend to make as much as men overall. Uh, also in the current world in which we live, single parents tend to be female instead of male. So you put the correlation together. <clears throat> Most single parents tend to be women and they tend to make less than their male counterparts, thus leading to a much higher percentage of poverty in single parent households. 86% of single parents report income from other sources, such as public assistance, food stamps, alimony, and child support, compared to 24% of married parents. Look at the difference there. 86% of single parents are having to get outside assistance. Oh, that's nearly all of them. Only a fourth of married parents are having to get outside assistance. That's a major gap. Possibly single parents spend more on legal fees because they have fees for divorce and separation and for collection of alimony and child support. I can tell you that from experience. Um, I probably spent about $25,000 um, on that first divorce and custody battle. I only made $42,000 a year. So I, I wasn't in a very high paying job. Um, I ended up having to work, take on a second job. Uh, I took on a courier route so that um, I could uh, Pay, pay the child support and pay the legal fees. I had some help from my parents and um, what ultimately paid off my legal fees and I suspect my ex-wife's legal fees too was that the house, we had a forced sale of our house uh, as part of the divorce and it went toward uh, most, of that. that's what paid off most of my legal fees. <clears throat> so um, the more you're spending on attorneys, the less you're spending on your children. And attorneys are going to get their money. If they have to garnish, uh, they're going to do whatever they have to do. And they are really not concerned that your children don't get a meal tonight because you had to pay their bill. So in layman's terms, in most cases, children raised by two parents have the benefit of two household incomes. When um, my former wife and I were together raising our kids, she had a teacher's income coming in. I had a um, office manager's income coming in. That got cut in half immediately upon the separation. Children raised by a single parent have one income only. And for children of divorce, the one income is often depleted by attorney fees. So we go through the divorce, I'm still making about 42,000 a year. I'm now bringing in about another 5,000 a year with the courier route and the mileage reimbursement from the courier route. But a lot of that is going to other expenses um, that are not affect, benefiting my children whatsoever. So in many cases, the single parent has nothing left to pay before you, toward education-related expenses after paying for rent, utilities, and groceries. The field trip comes up. There's no money to pay for the field trip. Uh, the child wants to be in the band. There's no money to pay for an instrument. So, so many of these outside opportunities are lost because 
once all the other expenses are paid by one income instead of two, and then attorney's fees, there's nothing left um, for education related expenses. That parent is just trying to survive at that point. In a two parent household though, parents have the luxury of alternating responsibilities as needed as well. So we come to educational opportunities outside of school. Uh, there's a school field trip. Uh, one parent household, that parent probably can't miss work to go. Uh, statistically speaking, most of the one parent households are, um, are struggling, many of them and this is not an across the board statement, but we just learned that statistically speaking, many of them are working lower paying jobs and they can't afford to take off work. Um, in the two parent household, one takes a vacation day, the other goes to work. That's not often an option in the one parent household. So many educational opportunities outside of school are lost. The single parent quickly depletes PTO, vacation time and sick time because there's not the other parent to alternate with. Uh, none of those exist in a single parent household. None of the opportunities to bounce back and forth with taking off days. So while a single parent usually has the best of intentions, they just can't be in two places at once. <clears throat> when I was a single parent, I couldn't be at work and on the field trip. I was very fortunate that uh, I was working a salaried position. Uh, you know, I had a college degree. I had an employer that worked closely with me. Most single parents don't have that luxury. And so uh, while they may have the best of intentions, it's just not the reality uh, that, that they live in. And so outside educational opportunities tend to become very minimal. The single parent just doesn't have the time or the financial resources to provide it. And what really uh, frustrates me a lot of times is single parents get such a bad rap with the media. I've often felt like we were under attack by the media and I'm probably being a little paranoid, but you never see a, uh, a positive story in the media on a single parent. Uh, you see children left in hot cars and it was always a single parent that did it. Uh, you see uh, abuse reported in the media and it was always a single parent that did it. You never see um, the well-meaning, hardworking single parents spotlighted in the media. And that's always been a frustration of mine. And that's another reason that this is such a passion because as I'm saying here, most of our single parents are very uh, well-meaning. They just lack the resources. Their resources have been cut in half through uh, outside forces and uh, experiences. So according to a study by professors at Johns Hopkins in North Carolina State, these realities have implications on how single parents organize their day-to-day -day interactions with their children, such as limiting the amount of time they can spend with homework or reading or limiting other learning experiences, library visits, outing to museums, etc. Think about homework, for example. I, I was working two jobs. I, I would work my salary position and in two weeks, two nights a week, I would run the courier route. Uh, I had my children Monday night um, and then Tuesday and Thursday, I would run my courier route. So Friday, when I would go pick them up for my every other Friday, Saturday and Sunday, I would be exhausted because I just went nonstop all week, you know, working my second job. Uh, so put another parent in that situation. And let's, let's say there's a, you're coming home tired and they have homework. You just don't have the mental capacity because of your exhaustion to give them the help that they need. And so many single parents, though highly intelligent, are just suffering from total exhaustion and can't be the homework tutor that they need to be. And it mentions library visits, outing to, outings to museums. Again, a lot of times you just don't have the PTO to take off to do it because all of your resources have been cut in half at this point. Uh, another study from the Netherlands and Penn State and Sussex says single parent families in our sample have fewer family resources as measured by the number of books and the number of items or possessions at home. This is not as much of a factor today with the advent of the internet, but it still is to some extent. I'm, I'm kind of old school and uh, I still like to have the book in my hand and I like to see my students have the book in their hand. Uh, to me, there's just no replacement for that. But studies have found that single parent homes tend to have fewer books in the home, which means fewer resources to learn. 
you could probably, I don't have the data to back this, probably correlate it to say there are also fewer laptops in the home today. Uh, most everybody has a cell phone, but uh, probably fewer laptops, fewer tablets. So I think the data would probably back that if, if we were to check and see. In many cases, in layman's terms, is the child must assist the parent since a second parent is not available and therefore has no discretionary time for outside opportunities. So if I'm exhausted, I've been working two jobs, if my children are old enough to help, I'm, I've got to have them help me. Somebody needs to wash the dishes, somebody needs to cook. Older children need to put the younger children to bed. And so if older child is busy washing dishes, putting younger child to bed, uh, cooking supper, what older child is not doing is uh, going to the library or going to the school football game or going to band practice or doing homework. Even as children, there's only so much time available in a day and the child can only do so much. So it has a trickle down effect with single parenting. You just, you can't do it all. The parent can't do it all and the child can't do it all. So it has a major impact on educational opportunities outside of school. Uh, the University of Massachusetts, as we already said, identify these children may cook or clean the house and be responsible for their chores. Older children tend to be hit the hardest because as we said, they often have to care for the younger children. And outside learning activities, as we said earlier, such as reading books or visiting museums become just a luxury item, which you hope to attain one of these days, but it's just not attainable now. Uh, the third factor is time constraints, which we've sort of touched on already, but there's more. A single parent often lacks the ability to perform the responsibilities otherwise handled by two people. You just can't be in two places. If I'm married, I can be in one place. My spouse can be in the other place. One person can only do so much. And I often uh, felt that frustration um, when, when my children would need to be in two places. Fortunately, my ex-wife and I did have, we, we didn't have a very amicable relationship, but we did have enough of one that we could split up things on the weekend. Sometimes if one needed to be at one event and one needed to be at the other, we could usually work that out. But um, and a lot of times there is no other parent. And a lot of times it's very unamicable and it just doesn't happen. And one person can only be in one place. And so with that, it's natural that an academic decline would follow. If I'm having to get my children out of bed in the morning, get them ready for school, help them with assignments, address their discipline, knowing me, we're gonna be late for school half the time. And homework's not gonna be all the way done. My kids are gonna be acting out because if I'm disciplining one, I can't discipline the other. Something is going to suffer. Or many things, in fact, are going to suffer because one person can only do so much. According to, uh, Author Eileen Bernstein, some mothers have to work two jobs, which makes them less accessible to their children. Many children of divorced parents are alone a lot, unmonitored and feeling unhappy. There may be less parental nurturing and inconsistent discipline in the home. And I can tell you in my case, sometimes discipline suffered because I just didn't have the energy to do it. And I tried to be on top of things as much as I could, but there are times when you're just exhausted and you just don't have it in you. Uh, what this quote mentions about uh, feeling unhappy, I remember a time when I picked up my children and my youngest son went straight to his room, didn't want to talk, and I asked him what was wrong, and he said, I'm just so tired of bouncing from two different houses. And so here I am fighting for more and more time because I want to stay in their lives, and yet there's a negative impact on them from, of having to bounce from house to house, back and forth. You know, nobody wants to live in two houses. So there's that impact as well. So it naturally follows that there would be unwanted consequences. Um, Ms. Bernstein also says, children from single parents represent the largest percentage of tardiness, truancy, dropouts, and expulsions. Uh, like I said, if I'm getting my children ready, and uh, I had two, but suppose I've got five. Um, we are probably going to be tardy every day if, if I'm trying to get five children ready. Truancy, they just don't come at all. <clears throat> Dropouts and expulsions. I can tell you from my current school, I, uh, my current school is sort of a neighborhood school. There is no bus service. Some of our students walk um, half a mile to a mile to school every day. 
many days the principal and I get in his truck and we drive the neighborhood to make sure there's no fighting on the way home. But um, he told me, um, he said, one reason we have such a high uh, absentee rate is because when it rains, uh, they don't come to school. Uh, you know, if there's a single parent and that parent's working, there's no person to drive them to school so they won't get wet. And so I'd stay home too, if it was me. And so there's so many little things that you don't think about um, that, that play into this. Next, we have lowered expectations. So as humans, we always rank survival as our highest priority. For example, you chose to attend this webinar today. Uh, mindfulness as a teacher is very important to you. The topic of single parents is obviously very important to you. So you made it a priority to be here. However, if you were to receive word right now that there's a tornado in your neighborhood, you would probably cut off your connection here and go take shelter. And so the same analogy proves to be true with single parents. The household won't survive if you don't secure an income, provide food for your family, wash clothes, take care of their medical needs. But the household will survive if you don't push your child to perform well in school. Every person has to prioritize in life. And the same is true with single parents. And so sadly, academics and school functions take last priority because they have to. Survival has to come first. And then if there's any time left for everything else, that's when you do it. So as a matter of survival, not necessarily a lack of concern, the single parent often has to lower his academic expectations for the children. Here's a quote from a study done by Johns Hopkins University and North Carolina State University. The goals that single parents set out for their children might reflect these limitations so that their expectations for marks in reading and mathematics will fall within a comfortable or reachable range. As a consequence, single parents might moderate expectations for their children's performance in schoolwork and adjust their behavior accordingly. I saw this happen in, in my own case. I tried to push my children pretty hard, but I only had them 39% uh, of the time. And so I couldn't address it the other time. Uh, my former wife was a school teacher, but she had uh, time limitations as well. And so even as a teacher, she wasn't able to push academics with them to the point that you, you would have expected. Finally, in this subtopic, we have the biological effects. And these are things you definitely would not normally think about because these are things that um, don't show up in statistics or on paper. Anxiety. Uh, according to, to Ms. Bernstein, children have, may have tremendous problems concentrating in school and doing their work because of the emotions that flood their minds and cause uncertainty. One of the uh, teachers down the hall and I yesterday were discussing a student that's on our radar that we're concerned about. And what we said was that she just seems to have shut down this week. You know, we can't get her to talk to us. And so we don't know what she's going through. And I'm sure that was going on with my own two children as well. Just going through a divorce, seeing your parents um, arguing all the time once the divorce is over, hoping for peace, but now they, they argue on the phone or they just don't talk at all. You're bouncing between two houses. That's a lot of anxiety that results from that. And so if I'm thinking about what am I walking into when I get home, which house am I supposed to go to tonight? Did I pack everything that's supposed to go to that house? Can mom pay the light bill? I'm not worried about my English test. I'm worried about the, are my lights gonna be on and what meal am I gonna have? This is the saddest statement I'm going to make today. Uh, Ms. Bernstein also writes in her book, a child of divorce is never certain whether he or she is loved. So imagine going to school every day and that's what's on your mind. You're probably not going to be so concerned about your math assignment, uh, your English essay. Uh, that just, just sort of takes the energy out of you. So anxiety is a major biological effect that affects these children from single parent homes. Another is sleep deprivation. This is one you wouldn't think of. One study says that a fundamental aspect of biological functioning, sleep, is affected by insecurity in children induced by marital conflict with consequences for multiple dimensions of children's functioning. So uh, 
Sleep deprivation often results in poor academic performances and negative changes in mood. Think about your own life. If you stayed up all night studying for an exam, uh, hopefully you did well on it, but in your other classes that day, you were just dead tired. You didn't care what they said. And you were in a grouchy mood that day because you had had no sleep. And this includes difficulty concentrating, reduced initiative, memory lapses, cognitive slowing, slower motor response, more errors of working memory. In other words, if I'm running on two hours of sleep, I'm thinking about one thing, and that's when can I go home and go to sleep? And many children of single parents are in that predicament. Sleepy students can't concentrate, they can't focus, they often exhibit a bad mood. Uh, they can't fully remember what has been covered in class. I see that a lot. You know, we cover something, we review it the next day, and many students have no clue what I'm talking about. And I find myself saying, we just covered this. But I have to consider that um, many of my students, um, and I'm teaching in a high poverty area, um, and so many of my students are coming from these situations. Sleepy students often walk out of the single parent home and into our classroom. So let's discuss. We are at the end of that section. What questions do we have? None at this time, but this information is very, very um, not surprising at all, but interesting to make some of these connections. Yeah, there's so much correlation that goes with it. When you see just the increase in the divorce rate, the increase in unwed pregnancies, and yet the decrease in academic performance at the same time, it's, it's hard not to draw that conclusion. All right, I'll give it about 10 seconds for any questions that may come to mind, and then we'll move forward. I'll say one more thing. It's not a question, but I do sure. like that the information is being, number one, that you're telling us where you got the information from. It's not just like, these are all of my opinions. Like you're telling us where you're, you're getting the information from. And that is not sometimes with these topics when you're talking about, um, you know, single parent households and unwed pregnancies and all these things they the person has the tendency of blame, of blaming the parent are blaming the unwed mother, which I mean, it's unwed couple, but whatever, um, to of getting themselves in that situation, right? Or, you know, that the situation is negative and you, you chose it. And I, I like that the information that you're giving is not doing that because it's not, it's not a fair statement, right? Um, and it takes two for all situations. So I, I appreciate that in your presentation. Yeah, I appreciate it. And I, and I kind of came up with those same attitudes. You know, my, my wife and I are, are strong Christians, but um, growing up, um, there were often much more legalistic teachings than, than we endure today. And so I kind of came up and in my first marriage tended to believe that if, if you were divorced, it was probably your fault and you probably could have saved it if you had tried a little harder. And going through this myself taught me that that is usually not the case at all, that Many of these people are in these situations by no fault of their own, and they're doing their best to get through this. So, um, yeah, living through something can totally change your perspective on it. Yes, it can. <laughs> we'll go into the next section. How do demographics factor into the situation? So there are three specific areas that we will look at. Racial differences, gender differences, and socioeconomic differences. Let's look at racial differences first. In 2019, almost 6 million black children in America lived in single parent homes. So there's a graph to show it. Uh, these children made up 64% of the black children in America. So if you're looking at every black child in America in this circle, the green are the children in uh, traditional homes, the blue are in single parent homes. So if your student, if your classroom is completely black, statistically, this is what it looks like. This is my classroom. We have, I have one white student in my total of about 80 students. Um, so this is what my classroom looks like, uh, statistically speaking. Um, 
if, if my classroom matches the national figures, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 students coming from single parent home. Again, this is statistically speaking, every classroom is, is different. Let's look at the Hispanic population. In 2019, almost 7.5 million Hispanic children in America lived in single parent homes. And these children comprised 42% of the Hispanic population. I have noticed um, in the Hispanic culture, there seems to be a much bigger emphasis on family. I taught in Jackson, Tennessee for a year and a half and the uh, parent-teacher conferences always really interested me because uh, my black children would come with their, their grandparent, uh, my white children would come with, um, with mom or with dad, my single, excuse me, my Hispanic children would come with mom, dad, cousin, grandma, grandpa. They brought everybody. The whole family came to the parent-teacher conference. And I, I thought that was so cool, but the, it was just such an interesting observation that I had never expected. So uh, uh, that's, that's the Hispanic. So if your uh, students are Hispanic, and if every student in your class is Hispanic, uh, statistically speaking, this is what your classroom looks like. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 children uh, from a single parent home. And let's look at the white population. In 2019, almost eight and a half million white children in America lived in single parent homes, and they comprised 24% of the white children in America. So the blue is single parent white children, the green is uh, traditional or non-single parent white children. So if all of your students are white and your classroom matches the national figures, this is what your classroom looks like. However, none of us teach in any of those classrooms because <laughs> every classroom is different. And so in realistic terms, you don't know what you're getting, but the bottom line is you are most likely going to have a high uh, single parent student population in your classroom, because in all three of those sectors that, that I studied, uh, there is a high overall population of single parent children. So regardless of where you teach, whether it be the inner city or the suburbs, public school or private school, you're going to have a substantial number of children in your classroom who live in a single parent home. <clears throat> Here's a study uh, done by Rice University. It said black adolescents have lived about half as long in two parent original or father stepmother and single father families as white adolescents and spent more time with single parents, single mothers or non parents. Uh, and statistically speaking, all this is statistically speaking, um, in the black population, there, there's more um, either the, the parents were not married to begin with or separated at a younger age of the child. Um, in the white population, there's more they're married for a few years and then they separate or divorce. So you're seeing the disturbing trend in both. Uh, they just tend to separate or one parent disappear at a different point in the relationship. And so black adolescents overall have not spent as much time as white adolescents with a two parent family. Hispanics have spent more time with single mothers than whites. Blacks have experienced more family structure changes than whites, which is evidence of more unstable family histories. And again, it, this goes back to, I was so impressed with the, the Hispanic students that I taught in Jackson that there was a much such a family uh, focus and emphasis there. And I think divorce is probably still kind of frowned on in a lot of the Hispanic population. And so you probably don't see as much of it there. And so Dr. Hurd's study also noted that black and Hispanic adolescents reported higher levels of emotional distress. Uh, black adolescents reported fewer school absences. Black and Hispanics were less likely to have college plans though. One disturbing thing that's not in here, um, we had a teacher pass away at my school last year and they brought counselors uh, onto the campus and a lot of my students had this teacher. She was a life skills teacher. And in every class I had that day, I really pushed it. I said, if, if, if you're sad, if, you're, if you don't know how to process these emotions, go talk to those counselors. You know, they're here for you. And one of my students spoke up and they said, well, black people don't see counselors. And so um, 
I, I tried to shut that down really quick. I, say, I said, I'll tell you who else doesn't like to see counselors, men, but I've seen one and it helped. And so don't take that attitude, you know, let the counselor help you. So that's, that's something also that plays into it. Sometimes there's a, a resistance to report how you're feeling or to get help for it. Dr. Hurd's study also said Hispanics rank themselves as less intelligent than did whites. What that means is when they surveyed people and said, how intelligent do you feel about yourself? Uh, the Hispanic students tend to have, tended to have a lower opinion of themselves. Black and, Hispanic, bleh, black and Hispanic adolescents had a slightly lower mean GPA uh, than did whites. Th these are students coming from single parent homes. This is just single parent um, specific. Uh, their GPA tended to be about a fourth of a grade point lower. Let's look at gender differences now. Since 1990, there has been a 62% increase in single father families in the USA to a total of 2.2 million households in the year 2000 or 2% of all households in the USA. I remember growing up in the 80s, that just didn't happen. You got a divorce, mom got the kids, dad got every other weekend and dinner on Wednesday night. And I'm, I'm sad to say that there's more divorce overall, but I'm happy to say that if there's gotta be divorce, I'm glad to see that, that men are getting more, um, more involvement, being allowed to have more involvement with their children. Because what doesn't need to happen is Neither, if both parents are loving, neither parent needs to be pushed out of the picture. Uh, Lee and Kushner, who we've, we've cited earlier, posed this question. Does the matchup of parent gender and child gender make a difference in academic performance? So this is a really neat study. <coughs> Excuse me. They compared every category of combination to see um, which one did the best academically. They said, let's look at a son being raised by mom. Let's look at a son being raised by dad. Let's look at the daughter being raised by mom. Let's look at the daughter being raised by dad. And let's see, do any of those combinations make a difference academically? That, that, that was, I thought that was so cool. They thought to do that. Only one combination showed a substantial difference and that was daughters being raised by dad. So in all three other cases, son being raised by mom, son is being raised by dad, daughter being raised by mom, all of those tended statistically to do poorly academically. Daughters being raised by dad tended to do well academically. And this, is, uh, this was their statement about it. The focus for fathers is more task oriented or concrete. Whereas with mothers, the focus may be more holistic, friendly, and accepting. So it's kind of like you asked my wife, um, about doing something, she'll, she'll say, well, we, you know, we, we're gonna plan this and then we're gonna do this and we gotta think about this. You ask me about it and I'm just gonna say, let's just get it done. So fathers are more task oriented. So they're, they're pushing the daughters and the research doesn't show this, but I would add that uh, girls tend to be more academically focused than boys overall. So you've got a father really pushing the daughter who's more academically focused. And so that makes for the best combination. Um, However, you rarely see that combination. You know, think of the people you know, and there's rarely a case where it's just daughter being raised by dad. Uh, here's another study that references something along those lines. Single mothers are more likely to be involved in their child's PTA than single fathers. Similarly, single mothers are more likely to know the names of their eighth graders friends and the names of these friends' parents than single fathers. Single fathers score significantly higher on only one interpersonal parental resource, educational expectations. So again, statistically speaking, mom knows the parents, uh, she's at the PTA meetings, she's at the band concerts. All dad's worried about is make the grades. So uh, that's kind of the difference in gender, how one parent raises versus another. Single fathers tend to provide a number of background advantages over single mothers. Uh, children from single father families tend to perform higher on standardized tests, but tend to have, but do not tend to have a higher report card grade. That's interesting. So if you're being raised by dad, you tend to do worse on your report card and do better on the standardized test. And I have no idea why. Uh, I would be interested to research that more and find out. <coughs> 
classroom behavior of children living with dad tends to be no better than classroom behavior than children living with mom. So there's really no gender difference on that from based on the studies. Children living with mom tend to have interpersonal and social advantages over children living with dad. And I think we would probably all agree that's probably because mothers tend to be more nurturing. Um, mom is usually the nurturer, dad is usually the provider. And so uh, they feel more nurturing with mom. And so interpersonally, they have a more of an advantage with mom. Uh, this study said parents from across all family types perceive their sons as less well-adjusted than their daughters. So boys being raised by a single parent are not coping as well overall as girls being raised by a single parent. Girls were seen as more scholastically competent than boys by parents and teachers. All right, now let's look at the socioeconomic differences. We looked at race, we looked at gender. So let's look at socioeconomic. The breakdown of the American family does not limit itself to any socioeconomic boundaries. Again, back in the 70s and 80s, um, we tended to stereotype. This was an inner city problem. Um, we tended to push it toward one race. And we can honestly say now that is definitely not the case. It's a rural problem. It's a suburban problem. It's an inner city problem. It's a black, white, Hispanic problem. It's everywhere now and there's no denying it. So within every different socioeconomic class, all three that, that are mentioned in this study, you'll find the American family crumbling. According to this study from Germany, roughly half of the achievement difference between students living in single and two parent families simply reflects differences in the socioeconomic status. <clears throat> Goes back to what we had said earlier on. Single parent has one income, uh, two parent family has two incomes. You can only do so much with one income. You can only do so much with one person's amount of time. In many cases, lowering of a student's socioeconomic status is caused by the family breakdown. Consider this, a middle class stay at home mom who finds herself with no house and in need of a job. So, uh, you know, we tend to think of inner city low income situations, but um, let's, let's cross the board here. You got middle class mom, she's stayed at home her whole life, um, doesn't have any work experience because her husband always uh, made enough money that she could stay at home. Now they go through a divorce, she's got very little work experience, they lose the house and she has no job. So suddenly that child who's used to having everything has nothing. Now, here's another consideration. A working class father who can barely afford groceries now after he pays alimony and child support. Uh, I found myself in that situation. Um, I only paid temporary alimony. It was it was like a three or four month agreement. It's kind of a settlement. Uh, but child support went on until they turned 18. And, uh, and child support was tough. And I had... Uh, a wonderful opportunity. I feel like God provided the courier route. I was managing, at that time I was marketing director and I helped with the IT department for a uh, medical management company. And they had a courier route after hours where they needed somebody to go to every office, drop off patient charts and inner office mail, pick up patient charts in their office mail. And so I started doing that two nights a week. And um, it took about three hours a night. So that gave, between that and the mileage reimbursement, it was almost to the dollar, the amount of my child support. Had I not had that, I would have struggled. I don't know how I would have made ends meet. So um, I guess the message from that is the, the parent paying child support has one of two options. They can go without or they can work a second job and um, be very tired and hope the other spouse doesn't find out they're working a second job and have their child support raised again. Uh, let me address another stereotype too. I, I managed physician offices. Not all payers of child support are men. We had the uh, female doctors at the uh, women's health practice that I worked at paying child support as well. So it's not just men that are paying child support. All right, moving on, <clears throat> excuse me. Additionally, with socioeconomic differences, there is often a loss of income that generally goes together with family disruption. In short, this is due to the fact that after a divorce, two households need to be supported instead of only one. 
and thus a lot of household expenses cannot be shared any longer. Instead of my uh, former wife and I sharing the utility bill, now I'm paying one and she's paying one. Instead of us sharing the, the water bill, I'm paying one, she's paying one. Uh, your expenses pretty much double. Your expenses double, your income cuts in half. And so that's going to create uh, some major financial issues for you. And then, uh, and then I'm just mostly talking about divorce. Consider that so many of these single parent situations, there was never one parent involved to begin with. I'm, I'm speaking from the perspective of, of a divorcee, but um, think about so many of our single parents who never went through a divorce to begin with. Uh, one parent was never in the picture. And so uh, there is no alimony, there is no child support. They're just trying to do it the best they can on their own. And they have it so much worse than I have it, than I had it. And so, Socioeconomics plays such a major role in this. So regardless of marital status, history has shown us that as a direct result of, um, a direct result of racial integration was socioeconomic integration. And I'll clarify on that. So we, um, we integrated our schools in the, in the 60s. And as a result, we resegregated our schools um, based on socioeconomics. We had the white flight out of the cities into the suburbs. And so, you know, I'm from the Memphis area and that's a perfectly good example. Um, temporarily, the schools were integrated by law. Within 10 to 15 years, they were resegregated um, by population and socioeconomic changes. Most of the white population moved to the suburbs. And so once again, you've got predominantly white schools in the suburbs. You've got predominantly black schools in the uh, in the inner city areas, and uh, with that resegregation comes a, a change of opportunity as well, because as as much of the tax base moves out, as much of the houses are left empty, um, so goes the money going into sales tax. If fewer people live in a community, fewer people are spending money at the convenience store, fewer people are going to the Walmart, and so much less sales tax is being generated. So there's much less money to put into your schools. And so um, now you have a socioeconomic segregation. You have very little money going in to support your, your inner city schools. And so you've got the same problem all over again being done legally now. So thus it is common for children of single parents to end up in schools dominated by low socioeconomic status. And as we have previously seen, fewer resources equate to lower performance. So instead of lower performing families, now we have lower performing schools. The school I teach in now, um, I'm told I'm, I'm new in uh, the Marion West Memphis area. I grew up about an hour and a half from here and then I married my wife and we're in her home area now. Um, used to be in a, uh, a a neighborhood with, with higher uh, economic status and that has changed over the years. And so um, we have uh, mostly low economic students in our school now. And we also have, we're also a low performing school academically. And again, it goes back to what we said from the beginning, fewer resources, fewer opportunities. And so um, socioeconomics is playing a major role in the performance of single parent children. Uh, according to a study from the Netherlands, schools with a large concentration of children from single parent families are usually characterized by a lower socioeconomic status and by less social capital, indicated by parents' social relations and networks with other parents. Therefore, all children ascending, attending such schools will perform less well compared to children at schools with a smaller concentration of single parent families. I wouldn't agree with the all children. I'm quoting the study. Um, the, the bottom line of, of that statement is, if I'm going to a, a school in the suburbs where many of the parents are doctors, lawyers, and uh, uh, high dollar businessmen, I'm going to be exposed to those opportunities. If I'm going to a school in an area where most people are working in factories and don't have as much money, don't have as much connections, then I don't have access to those connections as well. That's kind of what, what this is saying. And so along with the single parent issue, 
comes an, an immediate socioeconomic correlation. All right, that brings us to the end of the demographics section. What questions do we have now? None at this time. All right, I'll wait about 10 seconds. So we're going to get more practical with it now. And let's look at the long-term effects and then we'll wrap up with what we can do as educators. So there are at least three areas to consider when you think about the long-term effects of single parenting. One is adaptation over time. How do these children adapt over time to living in a single parent home? Two, uh, what are the effects of marriage or remarriage? And then three, what are the effects on society at large? So first, let's look at adaptation over time. According to a study from the University of Massachusetts, many of these children have had to learn to suppress their need for a parent to prevent their yearning for a parent's nurturance from reaching expression because they know the parent cannot respond. I mentioned earlier, we were discussing a student who seemed to have shut down. And so again, many of these parents it's not that they don't care, it's that they have nothing left to give after um, working two jobs, cooking supper, cleaning the house, and getting everything done for their children. It was a struggle for me, and I only had my children 39% of the time. Um, I tried to do all my housework and yard work and grocery shopping when they weren't with me, but what that meant was I was exhausted when I picked them up. But think about the mom who has the children 100% of the time and is trying to get all that done. I don't know how she does it because it was a struggle for me just having mine 39% of the time. And so that carries over to um, an emotional vacuum in the child a lot of times. It's not that the parent doesn't love the child in many cases, it's that the parent is so exhausted, there's nothing left to give. And so that love tank is left empty in the child. Um, because of this schedule the parents having to keep. And so many children in order to adapt to that just develop this hard shell around them. And you see them walking through your class, walking to your classroom with their hoodie on and their, uh, their earbuds in, just trying to uh, separate themselves from the world because many of them have just learned to put up this wall. <clears throat> the study also says the child may despair of ever gaining the parent's attention may learn that the parent is simply incapable of providing the investment the child wants, and then the child may withdraw or act out. I've got a, um, a child who's new to my class. Uh, he just came on about a month ago and he's in a foster home. And I'm seeing a lot of that in, in this situation, um, just, just acting out, likes to play the victim and yet uh, stir the pot at the same time. He, I saw a situation about a week ago where he said that a child was picking on him. Um, and yet, as I look, the child is not even looking at him and he yells over and antagonizes that child. And so that's, that's the acting out that we see here. And from this study, it's saying they're doing that because uh, they just shut down and said that, you know, I'm never going to feel loved. And so that's what we're dealing with in our classrooms. Children are walking in every day saying to themselves, I'm not loved at home. Um, it doesn't matter if I get kicked out of class, get sent to ISS, what does it even matter at this point? So that's what the single parent uh, dilemma is bringing into our classrooms a lot of times. A study from the University of Illinois said in general, the longer the time spent in a single parent family, the greater reduction in educational achievement. So um, the longer that goes on, the, um, the less focused there tends to be, statistically speaking, on academics. Thus, we see the high dropout rate. By the time you reach high school, you've pretty much lost interest. According to a study by author Nigel Barber, divorce raises the risk of high school dropout by, you'll see this, 150% for white children, 100% for Hispanics, and 76% for Blacks. Those are some huge numbers there. We're not, and on this particular slide, we're not even talking about the students who never had a mom or a dad in the picture. These are just the children of divorce. The uh, risk of dropping out of school increases by that much. 
So what does this mean, practically speaking? As the number of single parent families increases each year in our nation, we're moving toward a culture in which academic failure and truancy are viewed more as the societal norm. That's a scary statement to make, y'all. Um, the more divorce, the more unwed parenting that we see um, coming into our classrooms and the children of those parents coming into our classrooms, the more academic decline becomes just of a norm because Again, well-meaning parents just don't have the time or the energy, practically speaking, to do what's needed to do. Uh, there's also a mobility factor we have to consider. According to, also by author Nigel Barber, academic problems of children in single parent homes are explained by residential mobility as well as, low, as, well as lower family income. My foster student that I was mentioning a minute ago, um, I made the statement to him, as I sometimes do to my students, you, know, you don't want me to be your English teacher next year. Let's, let's try to pull this together. I want you to be in the eighth grade, not the seventh grade. And his statement was, well, I'll just move. So many of these students have come to know that I'm not going to be in this school but a few weeks anyway. There's no need to bother investing myself in this homework or this classwork because this is just a temporary stop. I'll be gone in a few weeks. And that's not just with foster children, that's just, that's with many um, children of single parents. Many times it's hard to pay their rent. You have to bounce from rental house to rental house, or you're bouncing from family member to family member. And so there's a natural decline in academic concern. If I know I'm only gonna be here a month, I'm really not going to invest myself in this. So the reality, if I begin a new school, I know I won't be there long, why should I make an effort? So let's look now at the effects of marriage or remarriage. These are some of the positive effects that a study um, from Texas discovered. There's a reduction of poverty because usually you've gone back to two incomes instead of one. There's a greater investment of time and resources. Again, there's two parents again. And so I've got more time. Two parents have more time than one person. And there's better monitoring of child behavior. So those are some of the positive effects if the single parent marries for the first time or remarries. Here's some of the negative effects. Increases in family conflict. Uh, we've all heard about step family issues. Many children um, have a hard time accepting stepmom or stepdad. Uh, many times the other parent doesn't want to accept stepmom or stepdad. So many times remarriage is just asking for drama. I guess in my case, it was fortunate in a way that um, when I married Michelle, my, my children were grown at this point, and so we haven't had to deal with that. There's also greater emotional stress from new routines, new expectations, new relationships. Um, and many times other children come into the, the picture. There's a blended family now, and there are often concerns of favoritism. Is one child being treated better than the other uh, by one parent or the other? So even though there may be greater financial stability and more time, more resources, there tends to be a lot more drama when we have a remarriage. So there's the good side and there's the bad side of it. So this particular study found a frequent increase in academic performance for the first few years. So statistically speaking, if you remarry, your children will likely do better for the first few years. However, they tend to level off as time moves forward. This study found that children from more socioeconomically, however, advantaged single parent families benefit more from mother's marriage than do children from less advantaged families. Again, that goes back to the statistic that women tend to make less money than men. And so if mom remarries, obviously there's an even higher financial advantage on average. So here's a startling projection from all this, from a study done by the University of Illinois. Educational advancement is one route out of poverty, but the children in these families get significantly less of it. Thus, this lower level of education will have long-term consequences for the economic well-being of the future family of this young adult. We're on a disturbing trend right now. We're seeing more children being raised by single parents, we're seeing more children in lower economic situations because they're being raised by single parents. 
And the trend shows that that tends to lead toward lower academic performance as well. And so uh, we constantly preach to our children as teachers, education is the key to your future. If you want a better life for yourself, get an education. But we're seeing less and less concern of it and less and less ability by single parents to promote it because they just don't have the time or resources by no fault of their own in many cases. Here's a statistical verification uh, by the study from the Netherlands. It appears that there's a strong negative relationship between schools' percentage of single parent families and performance, basically just verifying what we've been saying the whole time. Each percent increase in the number of single parent families at a school decreases the educational performance of all students nearly 0.8, thus 10% lowers the score some eight points. So they've even got it down to a formula that for every single parent student that comes into your school, your educational performance of that school is probably gonna go down by so much. Again, we don't wanna make a blanket statement, but statistically speaking, that's what they're often seeing. So an obvious conclusion is this, the, epi the, the epidemic of divorce, separation and unwedded pregnancies is creating an even larger achievement gap in our society. It's creating a larger number of children who no longer excel at school. And by doing so, it's creating a next generation in which a higher number of people may live in poverty. We've got a tough job ahead of us as, as educators, is what this is saying. Our job is more difficult than ever because of the trends that we're facing in our classroom. So that's the end of the long-term effects topic. What questions do we have at this point? Yes, and I love where you end it because it just made me think that if, if we know that this is our culture, right? Then that means that we need to do some different things in education. So I love that's where you're going because as soon as you said that, I was like, yeah, well, that means we need to update what we're doing. It's exactly. not working. It's not serving our current population. So I love what you, that you stopped right there and you're about to go into what can be done as educators. Um, we do have a comment slash kind of question. Uh, well, it is a question. Um, and the comment is interesting that there are more white dropouts than Black students. However, more Black students are being raised by single parents. Has research been done around the reason or the supports that are being given to our Black students? And I don't know that answer. I, I wish that I did. Um, I would, if I just had to speculate, I would, I would guess that probably, so I, I'm in a predominantly Black school. We have two white students in our school and they really try to, push us to be supportive of the situation. Last year, I taught in a pretty diverse school. It was about half black, 40% white, 10 Hispanic. And they really didn't put any support mechanisms in place. It was just whatever happens, happens. And I'm at a school now that's you know 99% black and um, in a much more poor neighborhood. And we're doing everything we can do. We, uh, we, uh, we do Saturday tutoring. We do tutoring four days a week after school. We're pushed really hard to call parents. So that would be my speculation. I don't have any research to back it, but just having taught in both situations, a diverse school and a school in a, in a, in a less diverse situation, that would, what you said, that would be my speculation that the teachers in the, in the lower income areas and in the, the areas that have a higher black population are being trained to deal with it more. Um, again, I don't have any data, but that's my speculation, having taught in both situations. You know, they're really pushing us this year. Don't let anybody fall through the cracks. Um, we need you teachers to be here uh, after school, if possible, to tutor. We need teachers here on Saturday. Uh, in fact, yesterday I was texting parents saying, uh, your child's failing. Um, here's a list of assignments they owe me. However, we got a Saturday tutoring tomorrow if you'd like to bring your child. And, and a lot of them stepped up and said, yeah, we'll be there. So that's my suspicion. And that makes sense that we need those kinds of supports in all schools, not just certain schools. And 
and, you know, not equating. I think one of the worst things that we do sometimes, even in society, I've heard, you know, politicians do it. I've heard mm -hmm. presidents do it. It's equating low socioeconomic with minority, right? Equating exactly. kind of interchanging black student, um, Hispanic student, Asian student, you know, all, all of the different um, minority cultures or BIPOC equating them to low socioeconomic and kind of using that interchangeably. So um, thank you for not doing that. And, oh, sure. um, and yeah, I think we just, we need those supports for all students everywhere. So gotcha. Um, the, one more comment that we have. Is let me, let me add to that comment. one. Oh, please let me go add right to that ahead. Because I thought of something else, so I'll, I'll forget it if I don't say it. Um, the other thing, having taught in both situations, I saw a real denial in my school last year that the situation existed. It was, you know, a very image focused school where we had the diversity and kind of trying to put out the image that, uh, you know, we're kind of wanting, wanting people to think we're, we're more of a wealthy school system than we really are. And we don't have any problems and um, we're just the model school system. And that wasn't the case. I mean, it was a good school system, but sort of a denial that we had any academic issues. And so if we deny it, we don't have to talk about it. We don't have to address it. Where in the situation I'm in now, you know, we're totally honest about it. We know we've got a lot of issues and so we're going to address it. So that's probably another reason that, um, that you see a higher dropout rate among those white students is it's probably a denial that the situation even exists. And we just sort of, um, you know, coming from the white community, I, I can say sometimes we tend to be very image focused more than we should be. And so we just sort of try to hide things and push it under the rug instead of coming out and admitting there's a problem. So that's probably something to do with it too. Eric, that could be a whole different webinar, just the denial <laughs> factor of a bunch of, um, yeah, in a bunch of different arenas is the denial fact, the denial factor. And we don't want, you know, we don't, we, we like band-aids. We are band-aid society. We love putting band-aids on things and not really digging deeper because if we dig deeper, we start realizing that just as a whole, we are not keeping up to par where we're not serving all of our students in our community. So thank you for saying that. I think that was oh, a sure. very important thing to say. Um, you had another question. Our next comment is just a comment that okay. uh, I am finding that, and this is uh, from the chat, I'm finding that incarceration of mothers is contributing to these factors recently. I would uh, not be surprised. I don't have any data on that, but I would not be surprised at all. And, um, and those are the end of the comments and questions. Okay. And I, I, I need to restrain myself and not get on my soapbox about that because I've, um, um, I have some very negative opinions of the legal system and the incarceration system. Um, the, uh, basically, statistically, if you look at it, and I'm going to try to limit what I say, but the, the more people we incarcerate, the fewer people who are voting and making an impact on society. Um, this is gonna sound kind of like a conspiracy theory, but the more homes we can see disrupted and broken, the more clientele we'll have in the court system and the legal system and the law offices going forward. So uh, this, this is just kind of my soapbox theory. I have no data to support this, but, um, my personal feeling is that there's very little concern in the legal system to improve the status of the family in America because we have a, uh, we have a legal system that relies on um, the need for cases. And so for every, every, for every home that breaks, statistically speaking, uh, you have more criminals coming down the pipeline in the future. Because statistically speaking, when you come from a broken home, you're much more likely to enter the crime system. And so uh, just my theory, my own opinion, uh, I think there's very little concern in the legal system for the family. There's lo very little concern that we need to improve this um, because the worse it gets, the more jobs we're gonna create um, within the legal system. 
And uh, again, that's just kind of a personal soapbox, <laughs> personal opinion. So going back to that comment, yes, uh, the more females we can incarcerate, the more people we're going to have, the more customers our attorneys are going to have down the road with their children. Eric, I'm just glad I was muted because I was aiming every <laughs> single thing you were saying. So I'm going to mute myself again. <laughs> All right. <laughs> We're going to move on to what can we do as educators. Hopefully, I didn't say too much there. Um, those are the discussions I have with my wife you, all the time. You said the way more than you think you said, and it was needed to be said. So thank you. <laughs> so what can we do as educators? There are two categories of actions that we can take as educators. One is influencing public policies. The other is making one-on-one -on -one efforts in our classroom. So we're gonna talk kind of about, about a macro approach. What can we do to influence uh, the big picture? And then a micro approach. What can we do in our classrooms? So the macro approach, influencing public policies. Number one, stop forcing one parent out. Uh, here's a study from Auburn University. It said with joint custody, it is likely that social capital would be more consistent predictable and substantial, thus rendering a more favorable environment in which students can develop their academic skills. Um, I can tell you from my own divorce situation, uh, I spent way too much money on legal fees. And that was money that didn't go to my children because it went to the attorneys. And I don't have any information on my ex-wife's legal fees, but I uh, think it would probably go without saying that she also spent way too much money on legal fees and everything. Uh, knowing what I spent, I doubt that her expenses were much less than mine. And so that's money she didn't get to spend on the children either. And so most of what we fought over in our divorce was custody. Uh, we didn't fight much over uh, the state of Tennessee said the house, uh, we both got an equal portion of it. So it, it would have to be sold and Either, either one person had to buy the other out. You, you had to come out even on the house some way or another. Um, most of the stuff we had, you know, she took her car, I took my truck, and most of the stuff we had wasn't of any major value. I mean, we had furniture and sentimental items, but we didn't have anything of any great wealth anyway. It was just typical middle-class belongings. So most of the expense of our divorce was fighting over the kids. And because they would offer standard custody, which is, um, you know, you get every other Friday and Saturday night and one week every other, one night every other week. Uh, that's what kept me fighting because I would say, no, that's not enough. I'm, I'm not settling for that. And so thousands and thousands of dollars going to fight for a proper time with my children, where if we were to change public policy where it's more equal to begin with, a lot of these legal fees we're spending would go away. And I'm proud of some states that have moved in that direction. Pennsylvania um, is very progressive in that area. I remember a bill came up in Tennessee. I, I lived in Tennessee then. I now live in Arkansas, but it, it didn't get very far. And my suspicion is it's not women's groups that are opposing it. It's, it's the bar. Uh, because if you can keep parents fighting over the children over parenting time, you can keep generating legal fees. So all that to say, uh, we need to influence public policy where it's more even to begin with. And um, most of the time it's dad being pushed, but not always. <clears throat> Actually, it, it goes back to socioeconomics. It's the parent who makes the least amount of money who's being forced out. And that usually ends up being the dad, but it's not always the case. But in reality, it's not the gender parent being forced out. It's, it's the parent making the least amount of money because he's got the least amount to invest in the legal fees. Um, a study from the University of Houston and University of Arkansas, these, those pub, let me start over, those official public guidelines, statutes, and policies which act to increase father presence and decrease father absence should reverberate in more children attaining the minimal sub-goal of attaining a high school diploma. We constantly hear of the effects of the fatherless society. Um, girls who grew up without a father don't know what to look for. In, in a spouse as they grew up. Uh, boys who grew up without a father don't know how to treat women or how to make a living in many cases. And so we've got to increase, we've got to quit pushing fathers out. Um, now, 
obviously I'm not speaking about cases of divorce or neglect. Um, I have no use for, <laughs> for people who uh, make the rest of us look bad by doing that. But when it's obvious that both parents are good people overall who just can't get along, um, we need to push public policy to include both parents as much as possible. Uh, we can easily conclude that children need positive interaction with both their mothers and their fathers whenever possible. And this was the thing that, that got me so hard when I was going through it is that uh, you know, I was trying, they were trying to force me out totally. And, um, and I, I wasn't willing to have it, but I had to generate a lot of legal fees in the process. Uh, the legal system is designed to create additional antagonism and thus remove one parent as much as possible. So in cases of divorce, and I'm trying to address both situations, the unwed parent and the divorce, but um, I'm giving you more of a divorce perspective just because that's the life that I, that I lived. Um, cases of divorce, they create a lot of antagonism that wasn't there already. And I shouldn't say this, but they'll have you spend $500 fighting over a $100 item. Um, so it's designed to remove one parent as much as possible. And again, as I was saying earlier, <clears throat> the more you can take one parent out of the picture, statistically, the more likely that child is going to be your client in a criminal situation uh, 15, 20 years down the road. So we desperately need legislation to stop this antagonism of trying to push one parent out of the picture. And again, it tends to be the father, but I honestly think it's socioeconomic and not gender related. I think it tends to be the father because the father tends to be the one um, making the most money who, who can pay the most, making, it's, it's the father tends to be the one who can put the most into the legal system or the least amount, but it's, it's often socioeconomic based as well. All right, number two, increase assistance to single parents. Countries having more generous welfare policies show smaller or no achievement gap or academic debt by family structure. This is from Penn State, the Netherlands and University of Sussex. It says to some extent, the investment in national family policy explains why Austria ranks at the top but the United States and New Zealand rank last in the academic resilience of children from single parent homes. So we can easily conclude that when a single parent has more discretionary income, discretionary meaning money left over after you pay the bills, she's able to provide more opportunities for a child. And so public policies which provide assistance such as job training, child support, enforcement, child care assistance and tax credits need to be strongly encouraged. So anything we can do from a legislative perspective to create more discretionary income for single parents, we need to encourage. We need to get away from the stereotype that uh, the single parent, mom or dad is a deadbeat. Uh, that's, that's a term I really dislike. Um, we need to get away from that, that mentality that the single parent is a deadbeat and do what we can to support them if they have additional funds to send the child to band camp, to buy the instrument, to send them on the beta club field trip. Uh, that child is going to be better off, less likely to enter uh, the criminal legal system, more likely to be a productive adult in the future. So we're not, we're not investing you know, into a welfare system. We're investing into the future of our children to create less of a welfare system one generation from now. So we need to change the perspective of how we're looking at that. Uh, what can we do as educators? That, that was the public policy perspective. Now let's look at the uh, individual perspective. One, become more familiar with the stages of divorce and they are denial, anger, bargaining, and acceptance. So when a child's parent goes through a divorce, they're going to go through each of these steps. And so when, we're, when they're acting out in the class or acting a certain way, if we know they're going through the divorce, we can kind of pinpoint maybe what's going on in their mind and causing this. An article from the reading teacher says, children react to these stages differently than adults. Although they may be able to deal with a divorce effectively at age seven, they may need to deal with it again at age 14. And so, there is no, uh, it's kind of like a death in the family. Uh, my wife lost both of her parents in the last three years. And 
you get through it, but you never get over it. So the grief today for her is different than it was when it happened, but you never get over it. You just tend to deal with it differently. And it's the same with the child of divorce. They don't get over their child's divorce. They just get to a different stage. And by recognizing that as educators, we can, we can pick up on some of these behaviors and how it's affecting their academic performance as well. Look for signs of stress in students, including personality and behavior changes. Be careful not to, not to create stress by hosting events such as dad's night or creating special gifts just for mom or just for dad. As an alternative, you might focus on someone special. So uh, I'm not necessarily opposed to donuts for dad or muffins with mom, but um, be very careful that you're creating some um, substantial alternative for those students who don't have dad or don't have mom. If you're going to host those, do your research ahead of time. Make sure you've got some sort of um, feasible alternative so you're not uh, alienating those children. So it's it's just it's not, we're not in the 70s and 80s anymore when most of our students came from uh, traditional families. So you got to be very cognizant, of, of, very mindful of that. And if you're going to do those events, do your research ahead of time. Make sure you've got some some step in dads, some fill in dads, and fill in moms lined up if you're going to do that. Keep books in your classroom which address the issue of divorce. And these are some examples: uh, "Don't Make Me Smile" by Barbara Cart, "A Girl Called Al" by Constance Green, "The Divorce Express" by Paula Denziger and the Kids' Book of Divorce by the unit at Fairweather Street School. I'm gonna leave that up for about 10 seconds in case anybody wants to take a picture of that with their phone. All right, moving on in five, four, three, two, one. This is a big one. Do not expect failure from your parents because they come from a single parent home. This is a quote from the reading teacher a journal. Studies have shown that teachers' expectations of students critically influence students' actual achievement. Too many times what we expect of children happens. If you tell your students they're dumb, they're gonna prove to you that they're dumb. Uh, if you tell your students they are highly intelligent, Hopefully they will begin to prove to you that they are highly intelligent. I know many days I walk in there and I'm thinking in my mind, man, they're acting dumb. But I, what I say to them is <laughs> you are highly intelligent. You are just not demonstrating that intelligence. I need you to demonstrate that level of intelligence. And so you have to take that approach, especially with these children of single parents. They're already wondering if anybody loves them. They already often feel like the world has given up on them and expects very little of them. So you've got to make it very obvious as a teacher that you have not given up on them and that you have very high expectations of them. Um, work with them, you know, realize that they, they have some um, obstacles, but don't make excuses either. Um, don't let them live with the excuse that, you know, I'm coming from a single parent home. I just can't do as much. No, uh, the answer is, yes, you have obstacles, but we're going to work around those obstacles and do whatever it takes to get past those obstacles. So, yes, we may have to adjust some, but, uh, but we don't accept failure. Be careful not to shut out the non-custodial parent. This was... And I, and I have to brag on the educators that I dealt with. I was not a teacher at the time. I've only, I'm in my fifth year of teaching. So going through most of my single parent experience, I was not a teacher. But I found uh, nearly all of my children's teachers to be very welcoming. What it took was me making the effort. And I had a former wife who um, did nothing to include me. And so I had to work around her. Um, she would go to school registration, um, put her information down and, and leave mine out or just put it in one place and put herself down as the custodial and me as the non-custodial, which was not what the parenting plan said. So um, I had to make the extra effort and go around her. I would fill out the registration papers and turn it in along with hers and they'd staple the two together um, because there was an effort to shut me out. 
but I would go to every PTO meeting that I could make. I'd go to every parent teacher conference and get to know the teachers as well as I could. And I would let them know of the situation, but I found all of my children's teachers to be very welcoming, very understanding, very encouraging. And so, um, that's what I need. We need to be as teachers. Be careful not to shut out the non-custodial parent. And a lot of times, now that I'm a teacher, I know that um, we don't really have a lot of data to tell us if there's a non-custodial parent or not. All I can say is do the best you can to get as much background information as you can. Uh, ask a lot of questions. And as you're able to find out that maybe there's one parent with um, a high level of custody and one with just a little bit, uh, do as much as you can to bring in that non-custodial parent, unless there are legal, um, you know, legal things keeping you from such. Don't break the law by any means, but to the extent that the law allows and that it's appropriate, try to include both parents. Attempt to learn about the custody arrangement for your child as much as possible. And again, uh, I've seen that it's pretty hard now that I'm on the teacher end of it, but do as much as you can to find out about those situations. Um, and this is my story right here in a nutshell. Many non-custodial, I had 40, 39%, but many non-custodial parents want to be involved, but they have been forced into the backseat by aggressive attorneys. Many times you had one parent who had a lot more money to fight with than the other. And that's why I was saying it's not always gender. A lot of times it's socioeconomic. The parent with the most money, um, a lot of times tends to get the better situation in the outcome. So many parents have been forced into the back seat by no fault of their own. Um, but we don't work for the legal system as teachers and we're not here to please attorneys. So uh, to the extent that you're able and that the law allows, involve both parents. Build and maintain a list of community resources for single parents and their children. These are two good examples. Um, I went through a program called Divorce Care, and it's a, it's, it's a Christian-based uh, support group for people going through a divorce, but they also have Divorce Care for Kids to get them through. And then a more secular option is the Exchange Club, which exists in a lot of cities, and they have programs they offer um, to help uh, single parents and divorcees. I'm going to leave that on the screen for a few seconds if you want to take a picture of it. Moving on in three, two, one. And that brings me to the end of the presentation. I know I have thrown a lot of information at you, but what questions do we have as we wrap up? <clears throat> We have no questions right now. Wow, I'm giving them a few minutes, seconds to think. These are all my references. And just for um, the purpose of transparency, let me just flash through these slides. And there's my wrap up slide. A uh, little bit about uh, me for follow up, and then I'll stop again and take any questions or comments. Uh, this is my contact information. Uh, feel, that's my personal cell phone number. Feel free to text me or email me. Uh, I am on Facebook. I put a little bit of personal stuff on there, but I mostly uh, focus it on teaching. And I have a few products on a Teachers Pay Teachers page. And I would love to share this more. I can speak in person within about a 100 mile radius of Memphis. I do teach for a living, so I have to be in my classroom Monday through Friday during the day. But um, with advance notice, I can make arrangements to be within a 100-mile radius of Memphis during the school year. I could go further in the summer. And I can do this anytime, anywhere. So um, if you would like me to speak to your group or organization about this topic virtually, um, I can go anywhere. Uh, and if you would like me to speak locally, I can go in, during the school year, within about a hundred mile radius, during the summer, I can go further out and would love to do so. I have a real passion for this and, and I wanna help as many teachers as I can uh, help their students of single parents and help their single parents because I lived through it and I know what how tough it is. And I've now seen it from both perspectives as a parent and a teacher. All right, any questions at this point or comments? So I am allowing you to unmute. If you would like to unmute yourself, just unmute and then wait for me to call your name just so we don't talk over each other. If you have any questions or comments, and of course you can also put them in the chat. So I'm going to say <coughs> last call, 
last call for questions and comments. You can unmute yourself now and just wait for me to call your name or you can throw it in the chat. Cornelius? Well, I was about to say good morning, but good afternoon. Good afternoon. How you doing, sir, Mr. Eric? Uh, ironically, we both work at the same school. Uh, I've been at this a few years longer than he has. However, uh, I was just sitting there listening and I also uh, went through a divorce as well. And I'm just that kind of, you know, you had me thinking about so many different things about not only my kids, but also the children that we serve. And I said, you know, here's a point. And I do try to uplift the kids because, you know, you really don't know what they're really dealing with. And just and it had me thinking about how much do I really know? Although my kids are of age now, 18 and 22. But at the same time, it makes me wonder. I said, you know, I'm going to give them a call. I'm kind of asking one of them to call me while I was sitting there. And I know I have a fairly decent rapport with them, but you're right. I can, as I was kind of reminiscing on what transpired, initially they started blaming themselves and things as nature. And there was a slight, uh, I can see there was some depression. And I really didn't know what, what to do with that. And I'm sitting there listening to you and I'm like, you know, and I was always working. I had to work even harder. Like you said, you know, I, I kept the home because I wanted to keep the family house. We didn't sell the house. I, in, in the divorce, she went to an apartment. I kept the home. I kept on saying I need stability for my family just in case things go wrong. So I would triple as hard. I mean, I mean, I was working and I'm still doing it because I'm still maintaining the house. And like I said, obviously, you know what our pay looks like because we're in the same location. And I was like, man, and, I, and then if I'm mad, if I'm barely managing, what about the kids that, you know, we service? Exactly. And, so, and I'm saying to myself, I want, you know, and I, and I know, you know, they're falling within, you know, the gamut of what you're referencing. I'm like, you know, it just makes me kind of take a step back and say, you know what, Cornelius, I'm about to find another approach of how to to present certain things when dealing with, you know, and I'm a numbers here. I'm a math teacher. So I'm sitting there looking at how many of these kids are walking around looking like that. And it's going to make me really take a step back and not only, like I said, talk to my kids, but I'm going to ask the question. I'm going to pull up you to the side because I'm kind of curious and would that actually make a difference if I got a little bit closer to them and say, hey, you know what, there is help. We're here, so to speak, you know. I know you're going through some things because I went through some things. My kids, are, you know, went through some things as well because they might be feeling like, again, not only not love, but they're alone. You know, I'm not going to talk right now. I'm going to stop talking because I know I keep on going. I know the time is up. And I've been like, OK, do I jump in right now? <laughs> do I jump in right now? Because I have a lot going on in my mind as I'm sitting there listening uh, as you speak. And, and like you say, you know, as I've seen you walk around the campus, always chipper. Who would have ever known that you actually had that experience as well? You know, we. We wear excellent masks. I guess that's the best way to say that. <laughs> and we've learned, we've developed them for sure because no one knows that we've gone through all these different things. I, I didn't go through as much as you went through. I, I had my share and you're right. You know, uh, she makes more. So I had I suffered more, you know, with the situation. And ironically, I still kept the house though, you know. But I, I'm a, that's my little two cents. I'm a stop. And I do thank you, sir. I really do. And when I see you now, I, I'm sure <laughs> I'm gonna nod my head and say, Gotcha. I'm on your side. I follow you. <laughs> you know, I'm with you. <laughs> but um, that's it. I'm, I'm going to stop there. Shut up, Mom. But thank you, sir. Thank you. You have made my day just by sharing that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's like I said, when I went through it, I thought I was very unique and I'm probably mm -hmm. the only person in the world dealing with this. But as I've, as I've learned more and more, I've found out, sadly, it's really not all that unique. There are so many people out there, people out there going through this. Yes, Lord. Yeah. You know, but God help us all. <laughs> God help us all. You know, I'm going to pause now. Like I said, I actually go, I had to get online for another class. <laughs> I get online for another class. So well, thank you for all you're doing. Yes, sir. And, and it also, look, I'll see you at Saturday school. <laughs> so <Right. laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll see you at Saturday school. Jesus Christ. Yes, Lord. You know, well, but thank you all. Thank you all. And I'll see you Monday, sir. All right. Eric, thank you so very much for this presentation. It just is really eye-opening to look at not only, you know, some of the things that we know if you're in certain situations in education, but looking at the data that goes behind it, looking at, you know, big picture and then putting it to what can we actually do in the classroom.
just a phenomenal two hours. And it really did not feel like two hours, um, but just a phenomenal two hours to to really stop and think of, okay, not, not using the Band-Aid solutions that we sometimes, you know, use and come up with, but trying to think a little bit deeper to help all, each and every one of our students. So thank you, thank you, thank you so, so, so very much. It has been a pleasure to be here, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity. And we'd love to hear back from any of you if you have success stories of trying to implement any, any of this. Uh, we'd love to hear from you.